It's a little bit better. Okay, this morning we are looking at the topic of hope. And hope is a feeling um, of expectation and desire for a particular thing to happen. And as I was thinking um, about hope this week, not just from a spiritual point, I thought that, you know what, we may hope that the weather is good. We may hope that we get a pay rise. We may hope that our favourite team uh, doesn't lose. On occasions, my team lets me down. Uh, not very often, but on occasions, uh, that does happen. Our hope and our uh, feeling, uh, um, our, our hope, sorry, is a feeling that is generally in things uh, that we can't fully uh, rely on. It's concentrated on the now and the future. But our spiritual hope is different. Our spiritual hope is very different. The King James Version of the Bible states that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The Christian hope is more than just a feeling of expectation. It's the evidence of things not seen. Our faith in Jesus is firm, it's secure, it's concrete, it's strong, it's trustworthy, it's evidence. Hebrews 6 19 tells us we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain, that is God's presence. We can enter into the very presence of the living God. I love this image of our hope being like a, an anchor. Our hope prevents us from drifting, despite the circumstances around us, just like you can imagine an anchor on a ship. The wind and the storm may come and put us off balance, but we remain stable and secure. This morning, I want to concentrate on three areas of spiritual hope. They are the past, the present, and the future. So we can have our first um, slide. Again, I'm just moving uh, something on my screen so I can see the first slide. That's great. Okay, so our hope is in the past. Isaiah prophesied in chapter 9, verse, verses 6 through to 7. He said, for, for to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Our hope as believers, as Christians, is in Jesus, who is God's son, who was born for each one of us. He is our wonderful counsellor, our mighty God, our everlasting father, our prince of peace. Now, this is not just for a season. We celebrate Christmas. Obviously, we celebrate Jesus' birth. But it's not just for Christmas. 
This is an eternal promise that will last forever. This is a concrete hope. It's permanent. We see those car stickers around Christmas time declaring a dog is for life, not just for Christmas. Jesus is for life, not just for Christmas. In fact, Jesus goes beyond life as we know it. In John 19, verse 30, on the cross, just before he died, Jesus declared, it is finished. This is the greatest uh, cry of triumph of all time. It is finished. It is completed. It is done. It is fulfilled. All that the Father sent Jesus to accomplish. It is fulfilled. His death on the cross was the completion of his mission. By his innocent sacrifice, all sin, all sin in our lives, in people before, our life, before us, people in the future, all sin and all sickness and every power of the work of evil, of, of the enemy, were overcome on the cross. So our hope is in Jesus who came for us and accomplished everything for us. The second part of our hope is that our hope is in the presence, in the present. Again, I'm just moving uh, something about on my screen here. Um, because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, we can li live in the victory of that now, today. We can live in the victory that Jesus has accomplished for us during this pandemic. John 16, uh, verse 7 says, um, uh, this is uh, words uh, of Jesus. He says to us, but very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Now, um, earlier on in John, Jesus tells us about this advocate. Um, he says uh, in 14, 17 and 18, you know him for he lives, he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. In John 1, 4, uh, verse 3 and 4, we are told that we have overcome all the work of the enemy, all darkness, because he that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. And he that is in us is the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God living in us now. In 1 Corinthians 15, 57, we are told to thank God because he has given us the victory through Christ Jesus. 2 Peter 1, 3, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all this by coming to know him. The one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. Now I'm pointing to these many Bible verses this morning because it's clear. It's clear throughout the New Testament that God wants us to live in the power of his presence today. The hope that we have in Jesus is not just about celebrating his birth that we do at Christmas time. It's not just about remembering his ultimate sacrifice on the cross like we do at Easter time. It's not only about celebrating our future in uh, eternal um uh, the, the eternal uh, promises, our eternal uh, existence in heaven. It's also about living in the fullness of what he has done for us now. 
It's about living in the power of his presence through this pandemic. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 4, my presence and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. He goes on in 420 of 1 Corinthians, for the kingdom of God is not just a lot of talk. For the kingdom of God is not just a lot of talk. It, it is living by God's power. So our hope as believers is not only in the coming of Jesus, but it is in what he wants uh, for us and how he wants to use us today. And finally, our hope is in the future. I'm just waiting for the next slide. Brilliant. Thanks, Dan. Our hope is in the future. It's in what God will do for us in the fulfillment of his word and promises. Revelation 21, verse 3 and 4 tells us what God has in store for us eternally uh, uh, for us as his children. It says this, And I heard a loud voice from the fr throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place <coughs> is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. As Christians, as believers, we have lots to look forward to. We don't have to be fearful about the future. We don't have to be fearful about death, about our eternal consequences. So when Jesus says of the Holy Spirit, you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. This is the truth. This is the truth of his word. We know the living God. This morning, if we're in relationship with Jesus, if we've accepted him, invited him into our hearts, we know the living God. He lives with and in us. He doesn't leave us as orphans. We are his adopted children. How amazing is that? His promises are different to our promises. They are 100% reliable. They're like an anchor. Our hope lies in, in what God will definitely do in the future. Not wishful uh, thinking expressed in everyday speech. So the fact that Jesus will come again and be with us eternally is part of our hope. As is the expectation that believers in him will be raised from the dead and will reign with him eternally in heaven. This is why, this is why church is so important for us to love, live and share Jesus. If there are, if there are eternal consequences to our faith in Jesus, keeping that to ourselves is the most selfish thing we can do. That's why we need to be comfortable. We need to be confident. We need to practice sharing our story. That's why we're, we're going to do this. That's why we're going to um, uh, equip ourselves as much as we can to be open about our faith. Because it has eternal consequences. Now, I've got to share with you uh, this morning, and I'm closing with this. I am reading um, a book that I've mentioned to you over the last few weeks. It's called Soul Winners. I love the title, and I've been in contact with the author. author. I kind of know him through uh, Faith Camp, um, and I've, I've bought several 
of his books. And uh, I started reading this and I want to read to you um, a couple of the opening pages uh, in this in, in the first chapter, uh, which I think are so significant and relevant for us today. If you want to get a copy of this book, um, you can. If you Google Soul Winner, you'll be able to get hold of it. Um, if you'd like me to get you a copy, I can get you a copy. Let me just read this with you, read this to you. It says, now that we are no longer hiding in our buildings, obsessed with our own spirituality and our soulish needs, maybe we can get down to real business, kingdom business. Can you not hear the alarm clock sounding? This is the hour when the church must arise. The saints must be equipped and the harvesters must be sent out. When the doors of our church buildings one day open again, we must be different. May we all, regardless of, de of the de denomination that we belong to, have a greater revelation of the actual purpose of our gatherings and an accompanying revelation of how God des desires to use us, even in our scattering. A somewhat parallel moment to that which we are in now can be seen in Acts 8.1. We see the early church, not that long after they opened, beginning to become settled in their meetings and formats when suddenly they were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria because of persecution. They were suddenly thrust back into the harvest field that Jesus had called them to. What would this scattering have initially felt like for those who were living in that moment? It must have been confusing, unnerving and uncomfortable. Yet as is promised in Romans 8, 28, God was at work even in that moment. He was working for the good of the church and the purposes that he, he had for her. What seemed like a bad thing turned into a great thing. Yes, their regular gatherings had been somewhat ruined, but as a result, the attendees went to places that he had originally called them to, and some set sail for the four corners of the world. As a result of this great scattering, the world was impacted. What if God is using this moment to shake his church, to equip and to send us into the world to reach people who, who we might not have considered before? What if? This, my friends, is indeed a Kairos moment, a moment when the harvest is calling, come. As you step into the pages of this book with a heart to learn, my prayer for you is that something fresh will awaken in your heart for the lost. My hope is that you will be empowered and, and equipped and sent out to reach the lost. You know, I get really excited reading this book. And um, it goes on and on. And I, I find it really encouraging. I find it really relevant to the season that we are in. So I encourage you um, to, to uh, get that book, if you can, and, and read it. Now, our hope is in what Jesus has already done. It's in what he wants to do through us now today. And it's in what he promise, promises in the future. I really do believe that we are in a significant moment in the history of the church. God is calling his children into a deeper relationship with him, into a deeper understanding of his presence. And he wants to use us as his children 
in power. Last week, we looked at sharing Jesus, and we will continue to do that. And my aim is to help equip us, I'm speaking to myself, equip us to do so. There is a harvest field out there, and they need the hope that we have in Jesus. I'm going to um, uh, end uh, each sermon uh, with a key verse. Uh, it's an idea uh, that came up, um, and I'm going to continue to do that going forward. I'm going to end uh, with a key verse that I want us to meditate on for us to think on during the week uh, as a reminder of, of the message and uh, for us to use um, as, as God wants us to. And that is Hebrews 6, uh, verse 19. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. There it is on the screen. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Hebrews 6, 19. I encourage us to reflect on that verse, to uh, uh, speak it, to read it, to meditate on it in the coming week. This hope that we have is firm and secure like an anchor. And it is in what Jesus has done for us through, through the cross. It's in what he is doing uh, in us and through us as his church, as his children today. And our hope is also in the future of what he will do. Let us pray together. Almighty God, I want to thank you that we have hope in you. And I want to thank you that our hope is not a wishy-washy kind of hope. It's not hope as we often think of it in human terms. Our hope in you is secure. It's firm. It's concrete. I want to thank you that we have that hope, Lord. And Lord, I want to pray for each and every person connected in to uh, this service this morning. Lord, that they will know that hope. That hope that we can have in you, the almighty God. Lord, I want to thank you that we have hope in what you have done for us. Lord, we thank you that you... You died for us, that you love us that much, that you gave your life for us. Lord, give us fresh revelation of that this morning. Lord, I thank you that you are a God that is not at a distance, that doesn't leave us to get on with life. I want to thank you that you're a God of the detail, that you love us that much, that you want to be involved in all aspects of our life. And so, Lord, we embrace your presence this morning. We invite you afresh into our hearts, into our lives. And, Lord, we ask you, fill us afresh with, our, with your Holy Spirit. Fill us afresh this morning, Lord. Enable us to live the lives that you call us to live, to share our faith, to be a good witness to live in the power that you have given us. A power that will impact and influence people's lives. And Lord, we also thank you that not only have you done this great, great thing for us in laying down your life, so that we can live and live in victory at the moment. But Lord, we have eternal promises. And we thank you for those eternal promises. Lord, help us to remain focused. Help us to remain in tune with you. Help us to spend time in your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.